Okay, let's get started. Good morning and welcome to our Climate Smart Communities webinar series. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Willow Ayers. I work on the Climate Smart Communities Smart program community. here at here. DEC's at Office of Climate Change. Um, hold on, I'm just getting a little bit of feedback here. Uh, just a reminder to the participants, please mute your lines. <clears throat> I'll start today with an overview of today's topic, and then I'll review some logistics, make some announcements, and then launch into today's presentation. In today's webinar, we'll be learning about fluorinated greenhouse gases, also known as refrigerants, what they are, where and why they are used, and the climate change impacts associated with them. Our speakers will include Kim Bodden and Marty Shupin, both with the Pollution Prevention Institute, often referred to as P2I. Before we launch into today's topic, oops. Before we launch into today's topic, let's review a few logistics. You may notice some differences in the WebEx user interface. For those of you who are logged in online but haven't yet connected to the audio, there's a few notes on this slide to guide viewers to the top left of the screen where there's an eye icon. If you click on this, it reveals the call and details for today's webinar. Please also be aware that we are recording this webinar, so it will be available for anyone who could not make it today. The presentation slides and a recording of today's webinar will be posted on our website within the next day or two. And please also be aware that we've enabled a setting where participants' phones are muted when they join the presentation. Please note that our speakers are designated separately as panelists, and we have a chat and Q&A capabilities. In the central lower area of your screen, you can click on the icons to access these capabilities. If you have technical problems or questions for us, please use the chat function. And once we start the presentation, if you have questions for the speakers, use the Q&A function to pose those questions. These will be answered at the end of the webinar. When the presentation is over, we'll have about 15 minutes to address questions. Here's the agenda for today, pretty straightforward. I'm gonna cover some announcements, then we'll have the presentation and Q&A at the end. Just a few announcements for Climate Smart Communities or other municipalities that may be interested. Uh, first, just a reminder that there are several state incentives for electric vehicles available. The Municipal clean vehicle rebates through the Office of Climate Change, uh, up to $5,000 per vehicle purchased or leased with a deadline of July 26, 2019. Also, the NYSERDA drive clean rebates up to $2,000 for plug-in hybrids or battery-powered cars, and the NYSERDA Charge Ready New York uh, grants. And just a note that uh, we'll have links to all of these in the chat box if you open that. There'll be active links you can click on for more details on all the things that I'm mentioning. A couple other grant opportunities, the New York State Pollution Prevention Institute community grants for outreach and education projects for pollution prevention due May 31st. And recently opened the Climate Smart Communities Grant Program for 2019 awards uh, 100,000 for certification projects and up to two million for implementation projects due July 26th through the CFA. A few upcoming events. May 16th, the Public Health Live webcast on the Climate Smart Communities Program. The Garrison Youth Climate Summit in the Mid-Hudson Valley on May 17th. May 29th, the local government workshop put on by the Capital District Regional Planning Commission at Hudson Valley Community College in Troy. On June 6th, we'll host a webinar about our Climate Smart Communities Grant Program. On June 12th, there's the fourth annual redevelopment summit at the Sage College in Albany. And June 19 through 21, the At What Point Managed Retreat in New York City. Also a note about the first ever Green Your Commute Challenge hosted by DEC, the Department of Transportation, NYSERDA, 
and 511 New York Rideshare. The challenge allows communities to demonstrate their climate leadership by encouraging green employee commutes and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. The challenge runs throughout the summer, and please contact Brendan, Brendan Woodruff at DEC for more information. Again, links to all the events and a link for Brendan's email can be found in the chat box on the right. Okay, let's, let's introduce today's speakers. Kim Bodden is our first speaker. In her role as a pollution prevention engineer, Kim supports the business assistance programs by performing manufacturing process assessments, material and energy balances, evaluating environmentally preferable and cost-effective alternatives, and sustainability certification scorecard compliance. Kim leverages previous experience in various manufacturing engineering capacities while at Harris RF Communications and Microwave Data Systems. Ms. Bodden has a BS degree in Industrial Engineering, an ME in Engineering Management, and an MS in Sustainable Systems, and is a Life Cycle Assessment Certified Professional. Marty Shuping is also with us today. Marty is a Senior Project Manager at the Galasano Institute for Sustainability at RIT, the diverse background, in many areas of engineering and design, including automated manufacturing, production development, design for Six Sigma, data analysis, finite element analysis, energy efficiency, measurement verification, and noise and vibration control engineering. Prior to RIT for more than a decade, Mr. Shuping designed automation equipment and tooling for automotive, business machines, and medical clients. He was then a consultant in new product development for 17 years and has contributed to products ranging from nanotechnology biosensors to multi-ton automated laundry products. Since joining RIT in 2008, he has conducted research projects in alternative energy and energy efficiency and currently provides technical assistance in supportive industry. Mr. Shuping holds an associate's degree in mechanical engineering technology from Erie County Community College and is currently pursuing a BS degree in electrical engineering technology at RIT. He holds several patents relating to product designs and innovations. Thanks very much to both of you for being with us. I'm going to make you the presenter. And Kim, if you can hear me, the floor is yours. Thank you. Can you hear me okay, Willow? You sound great, take it away. Okay, can you see the PowerPoint? Yep, the first slide's up, it looks good. Thanks. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you for having Marty and I today to hear about reducing impacts associated with refrigerants. Um, I can't see that. Right oh, here, me, I'll, I'll make it bigger. Hang on one second. Thank you. So reducing climate change impacts of fluorinated greenhouse gases. Our agenda for today, we're going to give a little bit of background of fluorinated greenhouse gases referred to as green, uh, GHGs. What are they? Why are they used? What are the environmental impacts associated with them? What's their projected usage? Um, alternatives? What can you do? Resources and questions. So fluorinated greenhouse gas is a man-made man -made substance. Chlorofluorocarbons, or CFCs, were first synthesized in 1928 as a non-toxic and non-flammable replacement for more hazardous compounds. So they're man-made, and there were other compounds used at that time for refrigeration, but these compounds um, reduce the hazards associated with the other ones, and now we know that we've, we introduced problems at that time. Their main usage, uses include stationary mobile refrigeration and air conditioning systems, fire protection, high voltage switch gear, semiconductor production, foams, aerosols, and metered dose inhalers. We know we're going to be focusing on uh, the refrigeration side of the applications. 
So the environmental impacts of CFCs in particular, in 1974, CFCs were found to be an ozone-depleting substance, and these are also often referred to as ODSs, and many attendees are probably already aware of this. And then in 1987, the Montreal Protocol was signed by 27 countries to phase out CFCs. And in fact, complete recovery of the ozone layer is expected by the middle of the 21st century. What Marty and I did was um, went online and we found some information on uh, the ozone layers are measured in Dobson, Dobson units. And we took the information online and graphed it. And we can see uh, way back in the, in the mid-70s, the ozone layer, the Dobson unit, was quite high. And then we had uh, uh, the lowest Dobson unit measurement was in about 1994. And we can see that while it's not back to where it was, there is a, a, a stop in where the Dobson units uh, started to decrease. So again, the full recovery is expected by the middle of the 21st century. So CFCs are considered class one ozone depleting substances, and that is the class one substances are the, the substances that are being phased out first. So that phase out began in 1994, and the relative impacts measured are measured through an ozone depleting potential, an ODP. So an ODP um, of CFCs are greater than 0.2. <clears throat> HCFCs are considered a class two ODS, and they were considered a transitional substitute for class one ODSs, and they have an ODP that is less than 0.2. Thank you. And their phase-out was later on. So while CFCs are phase-out in 1994, the HCFC phase-outs began in 2003. So just to um, give a little bit more clarification on what an ozone-depleting potential means is it's a relative amount of degradation to the ozone layer, which can cause. And so there's always a reference substance associated with a potential. So ODP, and we'll be talking about a GWP, a global warming potential, and the reference substance for ODP is CFC of 11, where that ODP is at one. So everything else is measured relative to um, the CFC 11 with an ODP of one. So HCFC replacements were HFCs, where their ODP is zero. However, they have significant climate change impacts, which we measure through a global warming potential, or GWP. So the uh, result of HFC impacts led to an amendment to the Montreal Protocol called the Kigali Amendment in 2016, which again began the phase out of HFCs in 2019, January 2019. So we put this graph in here, thought it was very interesting. It gives an illustration of the, rel the relative impacts of these three different um, classification of substances. So we have CFCs in red, HCFCs in blue, and HFCs in green. And what we can see here, we have global warming potential on the x-axis on the bottom, horizontal, and ozone depleting the potential on the vertical axis. We can clearly see that CFCs are um, highly impactful both from a GWP and ODP potential. The size of the circles uh, represent the, the length of time that those compounds stay in the atmosphere. So you can see when we went from CFCs to HCFCs, which are in blue, we, there was a significant improvement in uh, or reduction in the, in the impacts associated with those. However, there was still uh, an ODP associated with global, um, excuse me, with HCFCs. HFCs um, are barely, they have an ozone depleting potential of zero, but you can see the green half circles there, the global warming potentials are very significant. So the climate change impacts, as I mentioned earlier, they are associated with a global warming potential where carbon dioxide is the reference uh, compound and that has a GWP of one. So all other 
substances are measured relative to the impact of carbon dioxide. So GWP, so they're measured in carbon dioxide equivalents, so you can do a direct comparison of those. So we've made a table here that includes HFCs, and actually the first one in the table is R22 and HCFC, where they're used, and their global warming potential, as I mentioned, measured in carbon dioxide equivalents. And we can see that relative to carbon dioxide, these H HFCs and HCFCs are extremely higher using older air conditioners, um, current air conditioners, car air conditioners, and commercial refrigeration. And this graphic just gives a relative comparison. It helps to put things in perspective. So on the far left, we have a couple tanks of R22, and that's HCFC, as we mentioned in the table earlier. And compare relative to one tank of R404A, which is an HFC, and then lastly, these, uh, these tanks are equivalent to an annual fuel for 14 cars. So just to clarify, those tanks, the, the emissions associated with those tanks are equivalent to the fuel, not the emissions of uh, refrigerant, but rather the fuel used to drive those cars for one year, so equivalent to 14 cars. We often hear as consumers, um, about the impacts associated with driving. So we can see that emissions from refrigerants, HCFCs, or fluorinated greenhouse gases are much more significant than driving a car. So despite efforts to phase out fluorinated GHGs, as we mentioned earlier, there has been a phase out effort, CFCs, HCFCs, and now HFCs beginning phase out in January 2019, the emissions of these gases have increased about 70%, which is what is reflecting on the graph, between 1990 and 2017 due to a 240% increase in HFC use. This graph is interesting because it shows the overlap um, of these compounds that we've been speaking about, the CFC use, and then there's an overlap with H HCFCs, and then the last portion of the graph talks about the projected different projections of H HFCs. And the demand for air conditioning and refrigeration is increasing as the earth warms and wealth increases and population increases. So you can see that there's three different lines, projected lines, depending upon um, our continued increased use of air conditioning and the efforts taken to reduce the impacts associated with these substances. Here's a graph um, that shows the impacts of HFC emissions specifically um, relative to the applications that they're used. So you can see that we have consumer products and other uses, vehicle air conditioning, stationary air conditioning, and food refrigeration. And clearly, stationary air conditioning and food refrigeration are the most impactful and where a lot of effort will be focused. You can also see a small decrease in the impacts associated with vehicle air conditioning, and there, that's due to some of the efforts being made to um, implement alternatives uh, in vehicles. So there's some, been some impact there, but we need to make a lot of progress, uh, continued progress on the other applications. Project Drawdown, many of you may have heard of Project Drawdown. It was founded in 2014, and it consists of researchers, policymakers, business leaders, and activists who are working to, pre, working to present the best available information on climate solutions. We just wanted to put this graphic up to show that refrigeration or reduction of the impacts of refrigerants are listed as their number one um, solution to reduce the um, climate change impact. So what are alternatives to HCFC, HFCs? So alternatives exist that reduce or eliminate climate change impacts. However, there's no one solution for every application. An EPA SNAP program, which we'll be, we'll be referring to throughout the uh, presentation, is a, resource, a publicly available resource that has 
contains all applications and what alternatives, acceptable alternatives, alternatives exist. There are limited drop-in replacements, so retrofitting is often required. Some alternatives are toxic and flammable. Some alternatives don't perform very well, and, and um, updating equipment can be costly. And I think Marty has a couple comments to add on performance. So performance um, has um, a lot to do with um, the, the material properties. For instance, uh, the, um, the latent heat of vaporization or how much heat the, uh, the refrigerant can hold as it moves through a refrigeration system. And so that, that drives the efficiency of the overall system. And so some of these alternatives um, have lower efficiency than some of the, uh, the more common and, and higher, higher G, uh, GHG gases. Um, and then some of and the equipment, now there are some drop-in replacements, and what we mean by drop-in replacements is that you don't have to make any mechanical changes, you just have to remove the old refrigerant, put a new one in, or a new refrigerant in. So there are some drop-in replacements for certain uh, current refrigerants or high GH or GWP refrigerants. Um, however, you know others require um, you know some fairly extensive equipment updates. And I lost my mouse. Oh, there it is. Sorry, uh, sorry, folks. I <laughs> lost the mouse here for a second. Um, so here are some of the uh, some uh, more common alternatives. Um, ammonia is actually one of the oldest uh, refrigerants, and it is highly efficient. It has uh, no ozone depleting um, properties, and it uh, it has no global warming effect. However, it is. Uh, somewhat flammable and very toxic. If, um, if there is a significant leak, it's very dangerous to, uh, to human life. Um, however, it is still used extensively in industrial refrigeration. And, and, uh, now. and then CO2 is an emerging refrigerant, and uh, it also has an ODP of zero, and it has, as Kim mentioned before, it is the reference uh, GWP, so it has a global warming potential of, of only one. Um, it is gaining popularity in industrial uh, refrigeration, um, but it does have some, it does require different equipment, um, requires very high pressures, and it does have a limited temperature range. In other words, it can't reject heat into very hot environments like some other refrigerants can. Um, HFOs or hydro, um, hydrofluoro uh, olefins are have actually very low GWP and zero. I'm sorry, zero ODP and very low GWPs, and they're already used in uh, some automotive uh, air conditioning systems. They are mildly flammable, so they're not yet acceptable in. Uh, indoor applications in many areas. Um, however, they are gaining popularity. Uh, hydrocarbons such as propane uh, are also gaining popularity. These are actually uh, used in small appliances like the refrigerator. You know, uh, new refrigerators use hydrocarbon refrigerants, and they have um, low GWP and low um, ODP. Uh, however, again, they are flammable, so they're not, not used in um, large quantities. And then there are blends that um, have significantly lower GWP than some of the current um, refrigerants, but still rather high. And these are also mildly flammable. So, what can you do? Uh, one of the you know, one of the most important things is uh, to understand what you have in your equipment now. What, is, what refrigerant do you have? Um, and, and actually, I think uh, Kim is going to talk a little bit about this. Um, go ahead. So. Okay. So we wanted to touch base on the Climate Smart Communities Program. Many attendees are aware of this and part of the, part of the program. 
And in fact, we wanted to talk about with one of the steps of what can you do, you can actually understand what refrigerants that you are currently using to get it set a baseline as to where, how the performance, how you're performing. So in the Climate Smart Community programs, one of the actions under uh, Action 2 is a GHG inventory, and there's both, um, you may not be able to see it that well, but there's both um, a, a local government inventory as well as a community inventory. And fluorinated greenhouse gases are considered a scope, scope one emissions. So a scope one emissions, as you, you may be already familiar with this, is they're direct emissions associated with many of your operations. For example, the electricity consumed on site, the uh, vehicles traveled by um, your fleet or your cars associated with your businesses, and um, as well as, so I've talked about electricity or natural gas. So refrigerant leakage is also considered a scope one emission. However, what we found is that the inventory process emphasizes emissions from energy consumption and de-emphasizes refrigerant emissions. In the, uh, the GHG inventory, as you dig deeper into the process, the instructions, it, they provide guidance on how to implement the action and both in the local government and in the community, um, how to implement this, implement this action. It talks about uh, scope one emissions, but there's really no mention of refrigerants. It really focuses on energy consumption. It's not wrong, but it would, could be um, a little bit better to encompass refrigerants. So people that are taking GHG inventories are thinking about those um, sources of emissions. Also in the local government and some of the guidance, which is actually very comprehensive, the Climate Smart Communities Program does a great job in providing resources and guidance on this. So we're pointing out just um, some evidence of where there's emphasis uh, on energy and not on refrigerants. So if you look at, they encourage that you cover about 95% of GHG emissions and in general facility energy use Fleet fuels, street lights account for about 90% of local government operations for those communities that do not operate a landfill or wastewater treatment plant. So it focuses on energy consumption again, and there's no mention of an ice rink where that could be a significant source of emissions. Um, and so it's not on people's radars when they're looking to do GHG inventory. So there's also resources that provi are provided as part of the program, including a greenhouse gas inventory guide uh, that was originally completed by NYSERDA for the grant program, an LGOP, the Local Government Operations Protocol, the U.S. Community Protocol, and the New York Community and Regional GHG Inventory Guidance, again, done by NYSERDA. Again, uh, the Climate Smart Communities Program does provide a lot of very helpful resources um, in completing the GHG inventory. So the first resource on the list was the Greenhouse Gas Inventory Guide for Local Operations Completed by NYSERDA. And you can see this one paragraph, um, it, is, it can be um, overwhelming thinking about taking a GHG inventory and what do you include and how much do you need to include. And so this paragraph that was in that guide, it says if data is either difficult to obtain or available, uh, for example, leaked refrigerant, don't worry. So document what you need and develop. So it, it encourages um, people not to get stuck on not identifying all of it, but this is a discouraging um, communities from inventorying refrigerants. So another um, sentence midway down says, refrigerants data is considered de minimis. Uh, which means that percent of emissions resulting from that source is so small that it's not necessary to collect that data. If you are missing more critical data, for example, air accurate fuel consumption, um, refer to the LG LGOP for alternative methods for calculating. Once again, there's an emphasis on energy consumption or uh, energy emission inventory and a de-emphasis on fluorinated GHGs and refrigerants. 
The LGOP, if, if communities refer to the LGOP, which is extremely comprehensive and provides many different ways to, to collect your data, it is a great resource. However, there is information on there that clarifies that um, HCFC, so if we talked about R22 earlier. It's incorrectly referred to as HCFC here, but it's an HCFC, um, R22, and they're classified as ozone depleting substances, but because they're being phased out under the Montreal Protocol, um, they, and they have a global warming potential, the LGOP requires that they're not included as part of the inventory. So if you look at the second paragraph, it says, when assessing your fugitive emission sources, please keep in mind that CFCs and HCFCs, including Freon, should not be included in your emissions report. So again, if people are reading these and referring to their, these resources, they're great resources and communities can be doing what they're encouraged to do, but missing an opportunity. Um, a potential opportunity uh, that they could take advantage of. So here's an example. In 20, 2010, Schenectady did their inventory and they found that there was 22, 2,250 pounds of refrigerant had leaked from their ice rink. It wasn't known what the refrigerant was and they assumed that it was R22. But because it is not classified as a greenhouse gas, Per the information provided in the LGOP, they did not inventory that emission source. Had they included that as a leaked refrigerant in their emissions inventory, they would have realized that it uh, was a source of 1,851 metric tons of GHG emissions, their second highest contributor at 16%. That would have, uh, could have been a trigger for Schenectady to take action on the refrigeration system in their ice rink. And, but because the resource told them not to include it, they didn't. So doing what, what the resource is told, but missing an opportunity. So moving forward, language is gonna be modified in the um, Climate Smart Communities Program to encourage the inventory of all fluorinated greenhouse gases when identified, and putting more emphasis on fluorinated greenhouse gases as scope one emissions. Thank you, Kim. Um, realize this was enough. Um, so, as I mentioned before, one of the first things that you can do is understand. Uh, what fluorinated greenhouse gases you have or refrigerants um, and what so what's in your equipment so how can you find that you so you can work with your uh, your maintenance or facilities department or your Department of Public Works uh, or local contractors if that's who maintains your uh, your HVAC and refrigeration systems so what you want to find is what is the name of the refrigerant uh, for example the, our R22 and 410 or 404, there are several. Um, and the amount of refrigerant use. Now oftentimes, if you have a prepackaged system, uh, like the uh, dehumidifier shown here uh, in, in red, it shows what the refrigerant is and how, uh, how much it has. And then the, um, the picture on the right is from a, an industrial uh, a rooftop uh, chiller for uh, uh, that's operating at a brewery that we recently worked with, and you can see that that one has 37 pounds of R410A uh, in, in the circle on the right. And uh, um, so, once you understand that, uh, well, it's, it's important to know that fluorinated gases are only a problem when they leak. Um, and unfortunately, everything leaks at least a little bit. Um, given enough time, you know, all of these refrigeration systems that we have will all um, deplete down to atmospheric pressure. Um, so it is important to, uh, to um, keep an eye on, on that, and we'll talk about that in, uh, in a little bit here. So. Um, we are recommending a refrigerant management 
system. Now, the EPA has uh, their Section 608 of the Clean Air Act, which pertains to uh, generally larger systems. And I've included this, um, this graphic here just so that you can refer to it later on, uh, and it gives you some, some insight into uh, all of the different uh, pieces of this refrigerant management system. Now, when we talk about a refrigerant management system, we're not talking about a piece of equipment, but, uh, but a uh, system of, of equipment and record keeping and maintenance, uh, and, and what we're going to talk about that here in the next few slides. So first of all, uh, let's talk about applicability. Section 608 specifically uh, focuses or specifically ha um, refers to larger systems of 50 pounds or more of a refrigerant when it comes to leak repair and record keeping. Uh, technicians, the, the 608 also requires that all technicians uh, are uh, pass a certification exam given by the EPA um, and in order to work on any refrigerant sy refrigeration system, including um, a, uh, HVAC. It also restricts refrigerant sales and uh, equipment disposal um, to, of all systems. Now, we're recommending that all of the 608 requirements uh, be used by municipalities regardless of the size of their system. Uh, it, just because it's required over 50 pounds, you don't have to um, you know, limit yourself if, if your system is not 50 pounds or more. Um, so some of the technician responsibilities, I'm, and I'm um, showing these here because uh, for two reasons. One is if you use an outside contractor for maintaining your refrigeration systems, you should be aware of their responsibilities. It'll give you the opportunity to vet uh, that service to make sure that they're following all of the protocols. And secondly, if you uh, maintain your own um, systems, then this is what your maintenance people should be aware of. So um, all technicians servicing uh, refrigerant and AC, refrigeration and AC equipment must pass the certification exam. High GWP refrigerants can only be sold to certified technicians. Um, when, I, when working on a refrigeration system, the system must be evacuated to a specified vacuum level and take, in other words, take all of the refrigerant out and capture it. Um, and then any reclaimed refrigerant must be transferred to a certified uh, recycler who can then purify it and, or destroy it, and then uh, if it's purified, resell it. And then uh, the technicians must also maintain records of any refrigerant that they recovered or any additional refrigerant that they had to put in or recharge your system. And then they also have to share that, uh, those records with the uh, owner. And so this, so looking at the recharge records and the uh, um, and the transfer to the owner, we um, we move to the owner's responsibilities. So the owner must also maintain uh, records of the refrigerant type, the amount of refrigerant recharged, um, and uh, or, I'm sorry, the, the re refrigerant charge and the amount of uh, refrigerant recharge uh, made at every service call. And uh, so the second responsibility is the, the uh, owner operator is required to calculate the annual leak rate of, uh, of their refrigeration system. And uh, on, over to the right, I show you how to uh, um, how to calculate that. It's actually relatively simple. So you're just looking at how much, how many pounds of refrigerant was added to your system since the last time it was recharged, and normalizing that over a year. So, um, and then then the second part of that is what is the percentage of the total system capacity that leaks out every year, and that and and that will be, that's important. 
Uh, if we move back over to the left-hand side, you'll see that um, there, there is a requirement to find and repair leaks that are in excess of 30% of system capacity for industrial process refrigeration or 20% for commercial refrigeration or 10% for com commercial uh, cooling. So if you calculate your leak rate and it's higher than, than one of those, then that should trigger a uh, repair. Now I also show an example um, of the uh, calculation and I'm referring back to the uh, cold shot chiller, I use that as an example, wherein uh, that holds 37 pounds of refrigerant and, uh, and four and a half pounds was uh, recharged into that system after approximately six months. So you can see that the four and a half pounds uh, over 182 days um, and then, uh, you know, times the number of days in a year gives you nine pounds per year, and if you look at the nine pounds per year divided by the, the system capacity, that's 24%. So um, because that uh, was for commercial refrigeration, that would require um, a leak detection or leak finding and repair uh, process. And finally, I've included Reclaimer responsibilities. Now, this I'm including because some of the some of you municipalities are um, either developing uh, um, appliance recycling uh, centers where you take in refrigerators and old air conditioners. Um, so there there are some requirements for that. Uh, if, you, if you're doing that, you need to capture or evacuate all of the uh, refrigerant out of those systems and analyze it and verify that each batch meets a certain uh, level of purity. And, there, and I've referenced the standard there. It's from the uh, American Refrigeration and Heating uh, Institute. And you, and at the same time, lose no more than one and a half percent of the refrigerant during the reclamation process, and then dispose of any wastes uh, and maintain records uh, of what was recovered. And then finally, uh, those records are required to be reported to the EPA annually. Now, we mentioned leak detection, uh, so I want to talk about a couple different. Um, so, so leak detection. The type of leak detection depends on the, the system type and the location. Uh, and so you'll find refrigeration system in mechanical rooms or you'll find split systems like you might see in your home where you have some of the, the equipment inside, some outside, and then there are, are rooftop units, both um, split and, and self-contained. And then we'll talk a little bit about um, uh, leak, uh, detecting leaks versus finding leaks. Uh, so this is a, a picture of a mechanical room, and so a mechanical room is, a, is an enclosed space that has refrigeration equipment in it. So obviously if something leaks in that room, it's probably relatively well contained, and then you can have a, uh, a continuous monitoring room, uh, room detection system that uh, will pick up the, uh, the uh, refrigerant and trigger an alarm. Um, however, it, it can sense that there's refrigerant present, but it can't locate a leak. Um, so this is an example of a split system. And in, in the case of most split systems, there's, they're outside um, and, and air is being pulled through all of the active components. So if there is a leak, it will be um, dispersed directly into the atmosphere and uh, a, a closed system uh, leak detector, like a room, air, a room leak detector, will not pick it up. So shown at the bottom of the page here is a handheld um, leak detector. So that would be something you could sniff around the, uh, all the joints to, to find a leak. And, and this also, it, so it detects leaks and it also finds leaks. And once you locate the leaks, you can uh, repair them. 
these are a couple of rooftop units. So the one on the on the top is very open, and this would not be a good uh, candidate for uh, room type uh, leak detector. However, the picture of the one on the bottom, and I apologize, it's kind of a small picture. Uh, but when the co the panel covering this air or this refrigeration compressor is uh, in place, that part of the system is all uh, enclosed, and a uh, a room type leak detector would work. Um, and uh, so, um, then the other part here is if you're um, if you're having some leaks, you should look for uh, equipment and refrigerant alternatives. Now, so what I mean by that is if you, depending on the age of your equipment, or if it has high leak rates, um, or if you're using an ODS substance like CFCs or HCFCs, uh, you should consider upgrading your equipment to uh, something more, um, uh, something that uses a lower uh, GHG refrigerant, and you can refer to the EPA SNAP program to um, understand what some of those uh, op options are. And then finally, um, we're, we're going to recommend uh, an educational campaign focused on the community, and Kim is going to talk about that. <clears throat> so just to um, go back a little bit on what Marty was talking about to summarize, we realize that um, the EPA, the Section 608, is, re is a requirement for those systems that have a charge of 50 pounds or more. But it's an example of um, a well-established system or protocol that anybody can utilize to assist them in improving the management of their refrigerants. It's already existing. It's a, it's, a, it's a good protocol, so we are saying that people should consider using that and using those guidelines to help them uh, tighten up the management of refrigerants, the record keeping, et cetera. They're good guidelines. So as Marty mentioned, um, we're also suggesting the development of an educational campaign focused on communities and businesses. So if a community goes through the process of this refrigerant management system, and in fact you're managing your refrigerant or you look for an alternative and you find that you can afford and it makes um, economical sense to upgrade to a lower impacting refrigerant, you have all this information, it's a, it might be a good time to have, some, an, have an educational campaign and you're focused on community and businesses. You can educate on the impacts of fluorinated GHGs, understanding the baseline impacts, in other words, uh, looking at what your system already does to understand where you can improve, looking at alternatives, what alternatives exist, what are the resources that are available that we can look at alternatives, and then proper disposal at end of life, all the things that we've just spoken about. So what businesses would you focus on? Where would you focus? Uh, so this is an example of the impacts of supermarkets. Uh, they can be significant. This information came off the EPA's Green Chill program and is in a profile of an average supermarket in the U.S. An average size of the supermarket they considered at 46,000 square feet. It's important to kind of put it in perspective. But you can see there's two comparisons here. Uh, one of the annual GHG emissions associated with electricity consumption, and then the bottom uh, box is associated with the annual GHG emissions in, measured in carbon dioxide equivalents of R404A, which is an HFC. Um, the average, they're considering the average supermarket would leak about 25% per year of their refrigerant. And as you can see here, given those uh, inputs, the amount of emissions associated with refrigerants is greater than the electricity that was consumed at that supermarket. So those are quite significant metrics. And if a community has all the information, you take the time to develop a refrigerant management system, it may be worthwhile to consider having the educational campaign to uh, educate your businesses on 
on those impacts. So we wanted to also mention some resources. So first and foremost, um, Willow mentioned the beginning of the presentation that the Climate Smart community is going to have a request for applicants coming out very soon. And there's a webinar uh, taking place on that. So there's, specific, there's a specific category associated with reducing and looking at mitigation impacts of fluorinated greenhouse gases. Um, so we would hope that people will take a consideration of that category with the amount of money that's available to take steps to mitigate those impacts. The EPA's SNAP program, the Significant New Alternative Policy, is somewhere to go that has a lot of alternatives available uh, by application. The EPA's Green Shield program, if, if, you, if you are uh, affiliated with a supermarket, you're going to work with a supermarket, there is information available on that site. Supermarkets can become certified. However, they don't have to. They could take advantage of free webinars, events, resources, guidelines, and tools. Um, that is also a place to go if you're developing an educational campaign to look for resources to use in, in educating supermarkets. The Clean Air Act overall, everything that we've been talking about today has come from part of the Clean Air Act. And lastly, we talk about, mention here, a New York State Pollution Prevention Institute, P2I, where we are from um, as a resource to have questions answered or assist in, in kind of alternative uh, evaluation. So with that, we say thank you. And um, we should give that back to perhaps uh, Willow. As the OK, thanks very much, guys. Uh, you can leave that slide up there for a moment. Um, people can take note of your contact information. Uh, we have plenty of time for questions. Uh, several came through during the presentation, um, but I just encourage anyone else on the line to submit your questions in the Q&A box on the right. Um, let me scroll back up and I'll pull out some of the questions that came up in <clears throat> while you guys were presenting. Let's we can't see the questions uh, at this point while we're presenting, so if you relay them to us, we'll try to answer. Yep, no problem at all. I just wanted to get back to the ones that came in early on. Larry Ulfik, apologies if I mis mispronounced that, had a few questions from the very beginning, uh, the first few slides, about the point, 0 0.2 value limit. He was wanted to clarify if that was in Dobson units? No, that, so that is uh, that, that as was compared, the ODP. yeah, that's the ODP, and that is uh, the percentage as compared to uh, R11, which is a uh, potent CFC. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, a question came in from Dan Kogan, and he was asking about the refrigerants that are used in heat pumps specifically. Would you guys mind talking about that a little bit? Um, I think there's still a good variety of refrigerants in heat pumps, but, they're, but for the most part, um, they are still uh, HFCs. Um, there is work being done now uh, to find alternatives for those, but, but currently I think most of those are HFCs, and I don't have the specific uh, blends or, or uh, refrigerants um, handy because, you know, different manufacturers use different ones. So uh, we, can, we can look into that and try to answer it later if... But they still could be an issue. Right, oh, absolutely, overall, I mean, absolutely. There's, there's still concern and questions should be asked when evaluating heat pumps on the refrigerants and looking at alternatives. So being educated on what the impacts of refrigerants are and what alternatives exist, now you may be able to um, question the heat pump supplier on what are the alternatives and what are the impacts. And what, and what are their leak rates uh, right. on uh, factory assembled equipment. And this is of particular importance because right now there are state incentives, um, there are heating and cooling campaigns that are being offered all over New York State that uh, offer incentives for installing heat pumps. 
Um, I should introduce myself. Hi, everybody. It's Dazzle Ekblad. I'm with the DEC's Office of Climate Change here. You may have seen my name here on the webinar, but I wanted to pipe up in particular to mention that because those heating and cooling campaigns are a good thing. They're helping many homes, especially in rural areas, switch away from uh, high global warming potential uh, heating sources such as fuel oil, um, but there is a concern about the refrigerants that are used in these um, heat pump systems. So we encourage you, as Marty and Kim have emphasized, to talk to the installer and to ask questions about the refrigerants and the leak rate that are involved in those systems. So thank you for the question. Great. Let's move on. Uh, the next question also came from Dan Kogan, and it looks like he's asking about an additive for refrigerants that can help consumers smell leaks? I know you guys talked about leak detection um, in other terms, but can you clarify? Um, maybe not. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> Marty, being uh, I mean, an engineer, you may know what mercaptans are uh, or not. I think, so, I think it's the intent is it's the thing that makes natural gas exactly. stinky. This was added to yeah. natural gas for okay. that purpose. Okay, if that's okay. So yeah, I am I am aware of how it's used in natural gas. Um, I did I did not realize that it's being used in uh, refrigerants, or is Dan suggesting that it that it should be to make it easier to detect? Um, uh, certainly makes sense. I would I would think you wouldn't want to use the same one as natural gas, or it could cause some confusion. But uh, but certainly an odorant in a refrigerant would help detect it. Again, it would have to be in a closed space. Um, if it if it's in an outdoor unit, it would probably just dissipate and, and not be noticed. Okay, great. Uh, we've got a bunch of questions coming in, so I'll just keep asking away here. The next question also comes from Larry. Are there any plans to limit the reselling of high GWP refrigerants? Uh, we have Kara Paulson here in the room uh, from DEC. Go ahead, Kara. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm from the Council's office here at DEC. So um, I think your question uh, points to a potential rulemaking the department is considering, and we have a separate webinar series that was recorded um, and placed on our website. I don't know if we have the link readily available, if we can find it, but um, you can find what the department is considering to propose. We have yet to begin formal rulemaking, um, and we're still engaging in pre-proposal stakeholder outreach, um, but it is under consideration at this time. All right, next question comes from Melissa Everett. How are these HVAC responsibilities enforced, and where can we find the certified recycling places? There is a, a list of certified recyclers on the EPA SNAP program. If you follow through the link um, under reclamation, recycling reclamation disposal, you will find a list of um, recyclers there. And Marty, and, Marty and Kim, can you talk a little bit more generally about enforcement, sort of, especially sort of with the EPA's role and the federal role, because there there are certain substances that um, are. <laughs> I'm I'm getting a nod from the attorney, Kara Paulson, in the room, so she may have a different idea. But I I think that there, in general, in my as I've learned about refrigerants. It's been interesting to, to learn that there are sub-substances that they have very clear rules around the regulation, and then there are some substances that don't have that similar kind of enforcement and monitoring. Kara, do you want to add something? Sure. I just, uh, that's more complicated of a question than you might think. Um, I would just point you to EPA's website, and there's various actions happening on the federal level um, regarding refrigerants. Okay. Great. Thank you. Yeah, Excellent. I'll just add that the, the ahead, uh, P2I does uh, does not really have a, um, a regulatory role. Uh, we're more of an uh, outreach effort here, so so we don't have a lot of ex, um, expertise in that. Okay, moving on. Next question again comes from Dan. Why are the leak triggers different for industrial versus commercial versus comfort cooling? Leak triggers. Um, 
Yeah, those came from the Clean Air Act, and uh, you know, so I'm I'm not really sure why they are there. I think that's just that the industrial. Well, I think that part of it comes from the uh, the type of the systems that they are. So the large industrial systems are much more complicated and have um, uh, they're you know they have outdoor components indoor and and a lot of plumbing. So they're more difficult to see seal. It would be great if everything was at a low leak rate, but it, it's probably not really, um, it doesn't really make sense to try to hold everyone to the same standard. Okay, let's see what comes over to the extension from Bruce. Um, also be going to come in via chat. Okay, there's a few more questions coming through. This one from Jacob Fox. Do you know of any refrigerant recyclers in the upstate New York area? Not offhand. Not not that I I mean I has have has he checked the EPA website? Okay. We will note that. Let's Move on here. The next one from Lisa Adamson. What is the impact of residential refrigerant leakage and what are the best ways to educate about that? Is it better to go through appliance and box stores like Home Depot or Lowe's? Uh, so people are buying fridges with less greenhouse gas emission impacts. Okay, so if you're referring to uh, refrigerators, um, and then I think that's, I'm not sure I heard the whole, uh, or I remember the whole question, but I, if it's refrigerators and small appliances, um, I don't know that there's a benefit to going through a, to a big box store. I would think any, uh, the, the refrigerants are part of the manufacturer's uh, um, choice. So some research into the manufacturer of the refrigerator that you're using and, and what refrigerant they're using makes sense. Um, I, I hope I answered that question. Well, and, and this is a good question because it's one of the reasons that we uh, suggested that people consider using the Section 608 as a guideline. If you're using a certified technician, when people have their air conditioner at home um, maintained and the technician comes to service it, they w should be required to provide the owner of the air conditioner with information on relative to recharging and the the global warming potential of their refrigerant, and they could potentially ask questions directly to the service technician um, that way. So we're trying to close the loop on that end and require that the uh, technician provide that information to the owners. But it does, it is a good question in terms of how do you educate all residents on, on the impacts. Still looking for the reclamation. That, that might be a... Uh a good topic for a community education piece. Right. And another way that I comes to mind for me when people are asking about sort of uh, helping with education and what are the best ways to educate is to really take in some of the information that's been presented here about what some of the biggest sources are. Um, to sort of, you know, look, look closely at these slides, you know, once we've got them up on our website and um, think about those sort of largest sources and focus on the potential for, you know, doing an education campaign, uh, for example, with supermarkets and businesses in your region that have large refrigeration systems, um, and, you know, looking at opportunities to switch over to alternative refrigerants, um, and at the very least, you know, install these kind of leak monitoring systems that, that Marty has uh, introduced. I think that's a sort of another way that comes to mind for me because I think it's, it, you know, that, that helps kind of put the different sources in perspective. Marty, does that make sense to you? Did I explain that okay? Um, yes, you did. Actually, I'd like to add another, this is a little bit of a personal experience. Um, I would even include uh, the auto dealers and service centers in, in the community in uh, uh, education and outreach. Um, I had a, a couple of years ago, I had a 
car is still under warranty and the air conditioner stopped working and the, uh, the, the, the car dealer's service writer said, well, you know, we'll, we'll fill it up and see if it leaks out again. Some of these had a warranty problem. We don't know if yours is one, one of them. And, uh, of course, you know, that was the wrong thing to say. They got an education in, in uh, uh, refrigerant and, <laughs> and its uh, effect on the environment. Uh, but, so, you know, the right thing to do is find the leak first and fix it and then refill it. So, you know, a lot of people in the community can benefit. Marty, that's sort of a good segue into one of the questions that came through on the chat. Bruce asks about what percentage of car accidents is the ACE unit or tubing damaged? And is all of the R134A lost? Um, he has a couple of follow-up questions about the average size of the charge per vehicle and if municipal fleet repair departments reclaim their R134A or just let it vent. So uh, let me start with the last part of the question, and that is the, they are required to uh, recover the 134A when they do service on, uh, work on them. As far as the percentage of accidents that, that um, damage, where the uh, AC lines are damaged, I don't know what that percentage is, but uh, I would, you could assume that most of that refrigerant does escape if, if they are damaged. All right. Another question coming in through the chat from Peggy Cook. She says, we manage a, a not-for-profit ice rink that uses glycol and they need to replace the chiller. Do you have recommendations for refrigeration and funding? So the, so the yeah, the glycol um, just transfers the heat back to the chiller. Um, you know, we seriously would consider um, ammonia. There are some small charge ammonia systems now where, uh, where the, the amount of ammonia is at such a small rate that the danger of uh, toxicity is way down. So I would look at a low charge um, ammonia system would be one of my top recommendations. Well, she mentioned funding also, and I guess I would ask the Climate Smart Communities Program, would that be, uh, would, would they be eligible to apply for that grant funding? The Climate Smart Communities grants are only available to local governments, so towns, villages, cities, county governments, or boroughs of New York City. So it sounds like this particular situation, the ice rink, is owned and managed by a not-for-profit. So that particular entity, unfortunately, is not eligible for the Climate Smart Communities grants. But there may be other state-level programs that could support um, a changeover and an upgrade in the system. One thing to be aware of is that, uh, as I understand it, in my limited understanding, there's a really tight correlation between improving the energy efficiency of a system if you upgrade it, and so there can be sort of multiple benefits. If you're looking at upgrading an ice rink system, working with NYSERDA to sort of analyze the system and looking at some of their programs to do an efficiency analysis that could also be coupled with an analysis of what are alternative refrigerants that could be put in place or at least a leak monitoring and management system, and having kind of all of that happen at the same time can help be more energy efficient, reduce refrigerant emissions, and save on costs. Uh, thank you, Dazzle. I was going to recommend uh, NYSERDA and energy efficiency, especially if you're going to a high, high efficient, highly efficient refrigerant like ammonia. Uh, there may be something in uh, uh, through NYSERDA. Okay. Next question comes from John. He asked, do you think we will begin to use 20-year GWP data sometime soon? It seems like a better number to use. So I believe what he means by that is um, taking into consideration the amount of time uh, or the amount of the refrigerant that remains in the atmosphere after 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, John, if that's not what you meant. Um, it certainly does make sense. It's not the, the common uh, method right now. Okay. 
And I can also say that, that that idea has come up at some of the state level GHG inventories that are being done. Um, so it's, 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 it's some of the people who are specialists in doing greenhouse gas inventories have asked these same kinds of questions. So it's on the radar, but I, I don't, I'm not aware of any plans to change the methodology. I feel like there's some comments and discussion coming through the Q&A. Um, don't see any more questions. Uh, but we still have plenty of time if people want to submit questions for the presenters. And we do have a note from um, someone who's a participant in the NYSERDA Clean Heating and Cooling campaigns. I'm not sure if she's available. Uh, Melissa, you know, send us a chat or send us a note. Um, we probably could unmute you if you'd like to um, make some comments. Um, but at this point, I think we have covered most of our um, questions that have come in via the chat and via the Q&A. Um, the only other, um, oh yeah, you're right, maybe there are some, yep, okay, here we go. The only other comment that I'll make is um, earlier um, our DEC attorney, Kara Paulson, mentioned that the DEC is undergoing a rulemaking regarding the regulation of certain refrigerants. And I will dig out the link to that particular presentation and then those slides, and I'll send that via the chat, but it may take me a few minutes. But if folks want to kind of stay on the line, even after we kind of formally stop talking, we can kind of keep the webinar open. And if you keep an eye on the chat, I can send that link and you can get it that way. Okay, my mistake. It looks like there may be a couple more questions. This one from Therese. When will the Climate Smart Communities PE two actions of the GHD inventory be updated to include refrigerants as direct GHD emission scope, emission scope one? And would you recommend upgrading to R410A or CO2 as an alternative refrigerant to R22 in an ice rink? So this is Dazzle Ekblad again. I'll address that first question. Um, the updates to the Climate Smart Community Certification Actions under Pledge Element 2 for GHG inventories, we expect to release those uh, early next year at the very latest. Um, and but just to be clear, you know, currently um, the you know we encourage uh, applicants to the Climate Smart Community Certification Program, and also just anybody who wants to sort of get good guidance and do a good uh, greenhouse gas inventory to remember that, that HFCs in particular are one of the six Kyoto Protocol gases, so they should be included as a scope one greenhouse gas inventory. Um, so that that's something that, that is the case. Our guidance currently doesn't reflect that in a very strong way, but that is the case. So in particular, covering HFCs in your greenhouse gas inventories is important and is part of the kind of standard existing protocols. Um, covering refrigerants that are that aren't HFCs is a not and covered. This is something that um, Kim in the intro to this covered, but I'll just kind of reiterate. So there are those six Kyoto Protocol protocol greenhouse gases, and that includes HFCs, but there are these other substances that have a high global warming potential that are used as refrigerants. So we encourage municipalities to inventory those, and we will work on kind of providing better guidance about doing that, but we don't expect to be able to do that until next year. Okay, and to answer the question about the R404A or CO2, so the R404A is still a, um, a high GWP uh, um, chlorinated, or, or yeah, GHG, <laughs> um, or chlorinated fluorocarbon is a CFC, or I'm sorry, a, uh, HFC, sorry. Um, however, so the CO2 systems um, are, uh, are certainly gaining popularity and, uh, you know, they do show some uh, good promise and efficiency. Uh, there is an, uh, an issue, there is an issue um, about rejecting heat to, uh, uh, higher temperature environments, so they're not necessarily as great in the in the deep south as they are up north. However, um, there are what they call cascade systems, where you use uh, ammonia as the first stage, and it can be a very small charge ammonia system, and then that can that can re, um, take heat from a CO2 system, and the combined efficiency of those is still very good. Um, and you can you know use a, a 
smaller amount of ammonia and use CO2 as, as part of it. Um, or you can uh, just use the ammonia and uh, glycol to uh, transfer the heat. So there's some options there. We, we like the CO2 and the ammonia more than the R404A. <coughs> okay. Um, like we have two more questions. The next from Melissa who says, with regard to HVAC professionals managing refrigerants properly, what monitoring is done? Because I've heard that in theory, HVAC techs are required to show that they have the right equipment as a condition for licensing, but there's no enforcement mechanism. So I can, we can't speak to the enforcement mechanism, however, the uh, items, the, the components that we talked about today on the, uh, the Section 608 ruling, there, we've educated today on what should be done. So if you are looking at HVAC contractors, consider vetting them. You have, have information on what they should be doing, ask what they are doing and you could do a little background check on it. So there are, um, you know, requirements of certification for management of systems that are 50 pounds or more, but in looking at the APA list online, while there is a list, it's not, it's not, it doesn't look like there's tons of providers that are certified in the upstate New York area. Please look at that list and see if you can find someone. You can contact them and see who they might recommend, but also vet, vet them yourself. There may be people that are not certified but are handling refrigerants in a manner that meet the needs and meet the list of the Section 608. Now, now we've also heard that the enforcement is not strong. However, that's hearsay. Um, uh, but if you look at uh, on the um, Clean Air Act website, and especially the 608, they do uh, they do state on there that they make um, random uh, checks of of both owner operators of systems and uh, of technicians. Great, thank you. Last question that we have. Right now comes from Bill, and he's going back to the 20-year term for the GWP. He wants to ask how one can encourage the process. Uh, oh, how can someone encourage the process to move to 20 years? He says, we don't have 100 years to solve climate change. Who should we communicate with on this? For the global warming. Anyone from the EPA have a good answer to that? <laughs> Marty, do you mean us? Here at the yes. EPA? <laughs> yes. <laughs> We're not EPA, yeah. just to be clear. Not EPA. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's sorry. Yeah. <laughs> that's all right. Um, well, someone from EPA yeah, yeah, anyway. I mean, I, as I understand it, the New York State inventory um, is led, the GHG inventory is led by NYSERDA, but DEC plays a role. Mark, do you want to add anything? Yeah, and, and I think that What's happening at the national level is that the unreliant states and perhaps others are looking at the inventory procedures. And unfortunately, we don't have anyone in the room who has been working in that area. Um, but my understanding is that the, that discussion of perhaps moving to a 20 year number that um, Dazzle alluded to is occurring among the states. Um, I mean, Certainly, anyone can write us a letter, and we can put it in the file and give it due consideration. Um, but as Dazzle said, this is the discussion that is ongoing. Um, and um, but if you have additional information that you'd like to relay to us, feel free. And you can feel free to address a letter to the DEC to the Commissioner Sago. Yes. Of course. I'm just there was a. Through. Us, yeah, you and you, you can, well, sure. yeah, you can also sort of, also just sort of generally say DEC Attention Office of Climate Change, yeah. and then the NYSERDA team, there may be um, information on the NYSERDA website. NYSERDA has a website about the state level GHG inventory. There may be contact information right. there, or you can call NYSERDA. They have a great kind of uh, receptionist at the front end who sort of takes all sorts of different questions and connects callers with the but, but I think info the they need. challenges I think that we need to emphasize is that we, you know, there is mo they're constantly learning how to do these things, how to improve these inventory processes. 
um, but also to try to help them align with one another. Um, and so we don't have the kind of problem that um, was alluded to at the beginning here, where we have, you know, our program giving initial guidance was based on protocols that perhaps now we're finding are, are you know, out of date. And, and so there is, uh, this, again, an interstate discussion that would in, eventually inform how the EPA inventory process, uh, state inventory process works. Thanks, Mark. We've got some additional kind of comments coming in. Um, but I'm not seeing sort of clear, there we go. That's sort of a okay, yeah, question. it looks like another one from Larry. He asked, are there any stats for that, for the owner operator inspection? Not that well, we have. by EPA, right? Not by the, I don't believe the EC does though, so you'd have to refer to EPA for that. Is that what you were about to say, Kim? We don't have any statistics on, um, on the technicians sharing information with the residents. Okay. If that's, some, I, I don't know if that answers the question, but. I think it seems like it's the best we can offer at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'll also uh, respond to a question that's asking whether this is, the webinar is being recorded. It is. And I will uh, send a link again via the chat function to where the recording and the slides will be posted. Um, I guess I'll sort of uh, mention there, uh, as I mentioned before, there is uh, someone on the line who is leading one of the nice sort of clean heating and cooling campaigns. Um, and I could, un I'm going to just go ahead and unmute her and see if she's available to, to make some comments. Melissa Everett, are you there? Oop, hang on, I'm trying to unmute you. And it's not working. Oh, yeah, you're right. Sorry, Melissa, hang on a second. Uh, well, we need to sort of do use it via a different way. Um, and so, folks, I will also send, again, the link to where the slides and recording of this webinar will be located. We are usually able to get those slides and recordings up within about 24 hours, um, but it is uh, dependent on our uh, DEC web team and how, op how they can get that info up. Okay, Melissa Everett. You Hi there, can you hear me? Can you hear there me? There we go. Okay, great. So um, I'm Executive Director of Sustainable Hudson Valley, and we have uh, done a lot of kind of NYSERDA funded community outreach, including a clean heating and cooling campaign in partnership with Catskill Mountain Keeper. And uh, that program in NYSERDA offers regular, very informative webinars for the community partners. And at my request, they did one on refrigerants. And the bad news is there were technical difficulties and I didn't get on it. Uh, but I, I know where the archive is and I promise I am making a pledge to this group that I will look at that stuff in the next week or so and share it uh, because, you know, I've got a sister with, uh, who spent like $24,000 or something on air source heat pumps. Um, that were installed in such a way that they're hard to maintain and they have chronic refrigerant leaks and she's ready to strangle me. So I have personal as well as professional motivation. And um, we have several people in our informal but very motivated working group, Larry Ulfick and Michael Helm on this call. Um, and we're really, you know, looking at how to create community education and uh, you know, technician education and support and just figure out you know, how do you take all of the stuff that you're developing at the policy level and kind of really push it out to practitioners and communities in a way that gets us somewhere? Okay, thanks, Melissa. Thank you. So I believe um, we don't have any more questions. I'll give folks another couple seconds here if they want to submit anything new. We did have a comment come in about uh, doing more webinars on this topic. 
we certainly hope to in the future. This is a field where there's uh, technology is evolving and we would uh, encourage others uh, if they know good speakers or want to participate in a future webinar, um, I, I hope to do that. Actually, I want to check anybody, anybody else here in the room, DC have a question? Okay. And I'm remembering that I have a question, so if I could ask one quick thing. Marty and Kim, as you were speaking about the sort of refrigeration management system and all those different sort of steps and procedures of record keeping and kind of monitoring, it occurred to me that maybe something we could consider putting together and offering to Clement Smart Communities would be sort of a, a, a municipal model policy for refrigerant management system that could include some of those sort of steps and guidance that would make it kind of codified within a municipality's policies and procedures to take those sorts of steps and require that kind of information from the contractors that they work with. Does that make sense to you? Do you think that's a viable approach? Um. Yeah, I think that's interesting, and uh, and it would be it probably would be very nice for climate smart communities to have something that's better focused on on the municipality end of it rather than uh, industrial or commercial uh, focus. Mm -hmm. um, we should talk about that. Okay, great. Offline. All right, excellent. Yeah. Okay, well, it's just about noon, and since I don't see any more questions coming through, I just want to thank Kim and Marty for joining us today. Great presentation. We really appreciate your expertise, and thanks to all the attendees and the good discussion. Dazzle already mentioned it, but just a reminder that the slides and the webinar recording will be posted on the website within the next day or so. Also, please take our short webinar survey that will pop up at the end when you exit the webinar. We'd love to have your feedback. That concludes today's webinar. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.